Uh, we're opening up the book of John again tonight, and we're going to get started here pretty soon, but I wanted to have a, a word of prayer before we get started, and then we will uh, open up the book and get going. So let's bow our heads. Good evening, Father, and Lord, we thank you for bringing us here we thank you for the air conditioning that helps cool us off. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the blessing of being in your presence. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And tonight, we are looking forward to what you will teach us out of the book of John. And we pray that as we study this, you will open up our eyes and we will see Jesus in a new light. And by seeing Jesus, we will catch a glimpse of you. We thank you and... We ask you to lead us and lead us well in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, as I recall, we were in John chapter 12, and I believe we're opening up in verse 37. Nobody's correcting me, so we're going to go with that then. I think that's right. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that we had finished off the other the other section, and so... Uh, just making sure that I didn't miss something there at the end, but I think we've got it. So we'll, we'll start in verse 37. Let me read just 37 through 41, and we'll start there, and, and then we'll see if we can get all the way through the chapter tonight. Um, John chapter 12, verse 37, and I didn't do it yet, but I want a bit of welcome to those who are watching online. Uh, we're thankful that you've joined us, and feel free to leave us a comment, um, and we'll get back to you. Can't do it during the during the study, but we can get to it after, and we, we would appreciate and be honored to communicate with you. So John chapter 12, verse 37 says, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the promise prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. And I want to look at the big picture before we dig in and get into too much detail, because that little section right there, it sounds like God is intentionally preventing people from coming to salvation. Doesn't it? Okay, that's what it sounds like. I'm not crazy. It sounds that way. Yeah, like hardening Pharaoh's that's what heart. I was gonna say. So, yeah. okay, so let's let's open that up. What is that all about? Well, they actually hardened their own hearts, but uh, the Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But the problem is, is that because Jesus, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Because God was there, Pharaoh hardened his own heart just because he decided he wasn't going to listen. And okay. same thing with Jesus, the same thing, you know. It's, it's not that Jesus blinded their eyes. They themselves chose to blind their own eyes. They were looking in the wrong place. Okay. I uh, yeah. did a little bit of research on the in, on the plagues and Pharaoh and the Exodus. And God said to Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will let you go. Mm. And uh, then when it actually got into the plagues being poured out, 10 times it said, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Mm -hmm. He said he would go, and then he changed his mind, and Pharaoh hardened his heart over and over and over again until finally, when it gets to the end, uh, God said that he has hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would let you go. So it's like through a gradual process of rejecting God, and hardening his own heart, uh, he got to the point to where God knew 
that, hey, he's never going to change. Hmm. And it's kind of like a close of probation time okay. that we read about in the New Testament. And I saw a really interesting definition of the, the word used for harden. And uh, this particular scholar related it to a sponge. And he said, if you take a sponge that's got full of water and wring it out, all of the water that's in the sponge comes out. And what's left is a hard sponge. And that's kind of what happened with them. With them. Uh, they were, he was already condemned. Like Dennis said, he condemned himself. Mm -hmm. But then it got to the point to where there was no turning back. And so God said, and, and you know, God isn't afraid to take responsibility for, for the final end result of things because he has done everything he can do to, to show that he is just and fair. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds to me, especially when we refer to Pharaoh, it sounds to me like there's a process that has to go through in order to get Israel free to go out of Egypt. And, and it's, not, it's not that God is shutting the door and pushing them out of salvation, but he knows this, the only way that Pharaoh's going to let Israel go is if we go through this. He's, he's got to have his heart hardened and broken and before he'll ever let Israel go. And, and so I think it's, I think, I think, I like what you said there. Um, God is not afraid to take responsibility. He, he's not afraid to stand up and say, yeah, I did this. Um, in other words, I did these plagues. I brought these plagues and that did harden his heart. But that was a process we had to go through to get Israel freed from slavery. Now, how does that apply with Jesus? It's interesting, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. And I think we're looking at a process again. What is the purpose for miracles? Aside from the obvious, someone needs to be healed. But what is the purpose for miracles? I, I see you. I'll get you in just a second. Belief, so that they will believe. It gives them something to hold on to, to something, a foundation for their faith. And so Jesus is doing this. He needs to do this to free people from their unbelief, from their slavery to sin. And so he has to go through this and do it. But the result for these other people was everything he did hardened their hearts even harder. In other words, they've already made up their mind they're not going to believe. So the raising of Lazarus would have been the thing you know, it's interesting because the 10th plague was the taking of life. This miracle was the restoration of mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you'll see a theme in John where he does that. He, he pulls off of Old Testament and reminds us with the New Testament with the opposite. But my point is, out of anything, raising someone from the dead who'd been dead for four days, that should have been enough. If, if they were open at all, that would have been enough to get them to, to admit in their hearts, that this must be the Son of God. Walter. I believe that in the case of Pharaoh, and in the case of Jesus, it's a similar scene. And in a sense, since God or Jesus, whichever one you're talking about, uh, same one, same, uh, both cases, since he brought the information to them, he brought the truth to them and presented it and urged it upon their hearts. In that sense, he hardened their hearts, but it was their decision. Yeah. God never takes away the power of choice. So in that sense, yes, he hardened their heart. But in the final, final call, it's an individual choice, whether it's Pharaoh or you, or me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. They had, Pharaoh had the choice. Mm -hmm. But God knew beforehand what he was going to choose. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we need to look... Oh, were you about to talk? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Just a short one. Just that We already talked about the fact that God is always willing to take the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous saying from 
by, I think it's President Truman, the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. God is willing to take that stand and to, and to say, yeah, I could have countermanded, but I didn't. And this was their choice, and I let it, I let it go. Yeah, that's just good leadership. A good leader will always, it comes to me. Mm -hmm. I'm the responsible party. Yeah. 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 Instead yeah. of passing the blame off on somebody else, it's like, nope, I'm the guy in charge. You have to put that in the context of the fact that um, there are two groups of people, the, the good and the bad, or the righteous and the evil. And the evil are trying to destroy mm -hmm. and su make the righteous suffer. Yeah. So for God to allow that to go on and on forever w would not be love. Love yeah. means that God has done everything he can do to convince those evil guys. That's what Jesus said. I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save them from perishing. They were already condemned. Mm -hmm. We're all already condemned. What he, he wants to do is to save us. And, but finally, if God ever wants to have peace and harmony, he's going to have to destroy sin. And he takes responsibility because he has already proven that when he does, he's doing the right thing. Yeah. And the cross was the biggest piece of that. But we're, we haven't even touched the context of this thing because he's dealing with Isaiah. Okay. Yeah, it's reading in Isaiah 6.10. And it says here, which is interesting, that John doesn't quote it exactly. He just sort of, he, 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 he's a little bit uh, not exactly quoting exactly what Isaiah says. So what it says is, uh, yeah, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And then God continues talking to him. It's really interesting. He says, go and tell this people. So he, this is what he's telling Isaiah to do, which I think is really interesting. Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but they're not going to understand. He says, uh, be ever seeing, but they're not really going to see. So, but, but do it anyway, just like Jesus. He went to tell and share God's love, and he wanted that they just had blinders on by their own choice. And so, but be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart, and this is 610, make the heart of this people calloused. So the Holy Spirit keeps moving in our lives, moving in our lives, trying to encourage us, trying to, but you know, as we continue to say no, it, we callous our own heart. Mm. It's not God that does it, it's we callous it by continuing to say no to something. But it says, um, um, callous and make their ears dull and close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts. And this is the thing that God really gets at. He always, always leaves the door open for conversion. He always, always yes. forgives. He always listens. And that's what it says here. Understand with their hearts and turn... They open their eyes. Maybe they will see. Maybe they will hear. Isn't that neat? So they still have a chance and turn and be healed. And that's what John is quoting right here. Nor turn. And I would heal them. So God's promise is always there. I just saw something interesting that I've never seen before. Um, that... They are, John is quote, the, the Apostle John is quoting this passage here mm. in, in 610. Yeah. And this comes right after Jesus had talked about that he's walk in the light, I am the light, that be children of the light, the, these kind of phrases. And in Isaiah, this passage that he's quoting comes right after Isaiah sees the vision of the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. 
And he says, woe is me, for I have seen God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. So in both places, you're having a vision, a view of God and who he is in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And here you're seeing Jesus as God. Mm -hmm. And after that comes this, this uh, little quote from Isaiah. Yeah, good point. What's cool about that is uh, in 41, it says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. And that's stunning. Mm -hmm. Because in Isaiah 6, 1, it says, in that year, King Uzziah died. I, th I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high exalted, the train of his throne filled the temple. And then in verse 5, Isaiah says, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Lord is in all uppercase. And that means Yahweh, the Lord God. So John is showing that when Isaiah had that vision, he was, he was seeing the Lord God and identifying the Lord Yahweh with Jesus. Mm. And this is another one of our... Uh, our main proofs of the divinity of Christ uh, for our anti-Trinitarian people. Mm -hmm. uh, John said, hey, Isaiah saw Yahweh, and John comes out and said, yeah, that was Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty cool. Good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because when this was happening, there was a lot of doubts, but even in John's time, there were still doubts. And as you noted, even today, mm -hmm. there are still doubts. So it's good to see stuff like that in there. I find it rather interesting that you read through the Old Testament and you have people uh, that literally talk to Jesus in human form, in person. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham obviously comes to mind. Uh, and others, and, and here you have Isaiah in that category. Uh, when was the last time that happened? How long has it been? And why? How long has it been, and why? And why? Why isn't God talking to his people personally, not just in vision, like he did for Mrs. White, but in person. Why, why isn't that happening today? Are, are we that much worse today? Hmm. Good question. What do you guys think? I'd say the Holy Spirit is moving in a powerful way even today right now. And he probably is, in fact, talking. In fact, we know that he is talking in a personal way to many people. It's just sometimes we pray for the Holy Spirit and do we really want the Holy Spirit? Do we really want it? Do, are we willing to do what the Holy Spirit would want us to do? You know, are our hearts open right now? You know, we can cry and pray for the Holy Spirit, which we should be doing. But do we really want an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And the fact of the matter is that outpouring of the Holy Spirit is happening in parts of the world today. Massive amounts of people are, are coming into the church, are, are, are learning about Jesus, learning about Jesus' love, and praise God for that. I mean, it actually is happening in places in the world today, right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, well, we're sponsoring a little church because there of that. You go. all these rebels exactly. laying down their guns. And it, it just doesn't seem quite the Jesus. same as like he did to Abraham, you know, walk up to his tent and uh, sit down and talk to him for an well, evening. I, I think there's a difference, and Dennis was hitting on that, I think, is, you know, and Jesus said, it was, we'll come to it later in our studies, but it's expedient that he go up to heaven because if he doesn't go, the Holy Spirit can't come here. And so they've traded places. So instead of Jesus being the one in person talking, now the Holy Spirit is the one in person talking. Um, and, and that, you know, there again, you, you talk about the, the Trinity or the, the Godhead, the three, there's another symbol of that or another evidence of that, you know, because God the Father and God the Son are both in heaven 
the Holy Spirit has come down to be our caretaker and our our guide. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I get your point, though. Because Abraham is sitting in his tent and he sees Jesus walk up, you know. Um, Joshua, out in the woods, he's getting ready to go attack Jericho and he comes across someone with a sword and guess who it is? Um, it's the Lord. So ja Jacob wrestling. Jacob wrestling, you know, there's... there's Physically handling him. Yeah, so there, there are stories that occurred then and I think, me speaking for me, I'm a little envious. It'd be kind of nice to, to bump into Jesus. You know, Jesus said it himself. There were people who looked forward to this day and never got to see it I just, other than envision. It would be such a life-changing event. Yeah. yeah. But he said it's better for him to go and send the Holy Spirit than for us to bump into him here. Absolutely. So while we're envious, and, and it's only envious because of our desire to be with him. But, and, and yet there was the Holy Spirit in the, in the Old Testament days as well. And, and I'll just say this, just to cap off this part of the conversation. And I'm not thinking, uh, I don't have the phrase in my head right, but um, distance, is it distance that makes the heart grow fonder? Absence. Absence, Absence. okay. Same Absence thing. makes the heart grow fonder. Um, and, and so there's, there's something to this current separation from Jesus because our desire grows and grows to be with him for eternity. And the beautiful thing is we have the promise that we're going to receive that. Um, and as Jack will say, we've already received it, but not yet. Um, it's coming one day. Anyway, um, it good, it good to sit here and think about what that's going to be like. Uh, just a quick th thought th to maybe wrap this up. Mm -hmm. uh, back to Pharaoh, every plague was an opportunity for Pharaoh to acknowledge God's grace and commit or surrender to God or to see God's punishment. So we see justice and grace together in every plague, every step along the way. And it, it was like Dennis said, he always provides the opportunity for us to be saved. So what we should be thinking about today, just like Pharaoh, the constant rejection of God brought him to the close of probation when God said, I have healed, have hardened his heart. Every little decision we make today, Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. You're either gathering with me or scattering. So every decision we make is moving us along to that same point until finally he says it is done. Mm -hmm. It's moving us one of two directions. None of us are staying in the same place. You can't. You're We're either, either moving closer him to him or further scattering. away. Scattering. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and the absolutely. price of holding out for Pharaoh cost him his firstborn. You, you ask about Jesus being here today, and well, I hope we would treat him better than when he came the first time, okay, but anyway, Jesus himself said, very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that it is for your good that I am going away. Because unless I go away, the advocate, the advocate will not even come to you. Isn't that interesting? But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove and convict the world. So Jesus says, it's, it's for your good. Jesus, I think, would have our best good in mind. So he's telling us this is better for us. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere. He, he as human being, could only be in one place at a time. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then let's move forward to verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. So we're shifting gears here. Notice the shift. We just got done talking about people not believing in him. Now verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. 
Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Okay. <laughs> Something I just realized, we kind of left out a piece on this former part, and it's not about the former part, but from verse 37 through verse 50, that whole section is kind of uh, John summarizing mm -hmm. Jesus' teachings mm -hmm. and what Jesus was all about, why he was here. Um, the verse right before it in verse uh, 36, uh, when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. It, it's kind of like coming to the end of something. And a lot of commentators believe that that is the end of the public ministry of Jesus. And that everything that comes after that is between Jesus and the disciples. And between that, John puts this kind of a summary of what Jesus was all about. And, and then having said that, which we should have said before we got into the last part, we just weren't thinking. <laughs> but anyway, um, verse 44 has a funny little word there. Um, then is what my version says. Probably some versions have, have uh, and or, or but. Not but, probably. But anyway, the Greek word is de which it means and, or but, or then, or so, or a whole bunch of other words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a conjunction, conjunction between one section to the next section, and you kind of have to know by context what word to put there, or if any, you can just leave it out. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're reading along to verse 44 and you read, then Jesus cried out, it almost sounds as if he's in a room and he cries out and says this. I have a feeling it's more like John, like we were saying, John giving the summary of what Jesus taught and saying in verse 44, this is what Jesus said. Jesus cried out. He constantly was preaching. Whoever believes in me does not believe and, and going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the word then could mislead us. Um, I, don't, I don't like that translation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that it, uh, one of the other translations is probably better that, that gives the idea, and I, I think the word so could work, mm -hmm. or to just mm -hmm. leave it out, one or the other. I find it interesting, and, and you went back, and, and good that you went back, because it, it's tying in something. John has been building it's interesting because John is not known for his literacy he is not known for his scholarship yet he's brilliant yeah. <laughs> he's a brilliant writer and as you go through and you read this he's talking about um, not believing and, and what was that you read in verse 36 the these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them yeah um, you get the darkness you get the the blindness you know, he says in verse 40 that he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, you know, lest they might see with their eyes. If you go back in the very beginning of John in his uh, prologue, you see between verse 6 and 13, he's talking about the light. He's talking about the, the, Jesus being the light that came into the world to overcome the darkness. The darkness couldn't comprehend it. You see the same theme going on here. He is the light, but the darkness doesn't comprehend the light. And then you go to Nicodemus in chapter 3, the conversation that they were having. Um, 
Let me just start in verse 18. He says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does truth comes to the light, that his deeds might be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So you see, John is is kept with his theme from the very beginning of the writing of this book, the differentiation between the light and the dark. And he's identified, obviously, Jesus is the light. And Jesus is, is reiterating this here, or, or going along with it. In other words, John's reporting what Jesus has been teaching about the darkness and the light. And it just, it opens up this passage here of why they were not believing. Mm-hmm. Because they were in darkness, they preferred the darkness because those who practice evil choose to remain in darkness. So this hardening of their hearts, it just illustrates really that, yeah, the light was there, but they refused They refuse to come out into the light and and to be seen. Anyway, um, I just think when you you open that up, it it just really tied everything together for the first 12 chapters of John. It kept the theme going. And Mm -hmm. and really, I think it ties in with Revelation as well, which he wrote. Yeah, (laughs) and I just had another thought when you brought that up. what did God create on the first day? Hmm. I don't know. It was dark <laughs> that day. <laughs> he created light out of darkness, and that represents salvation, Christ, mm-hmm. justification, and then all the rest of the week he brought order, which would equate with sanctification to what he had already made. Yeah, and it's interesting. It identifies that the dark was there first. Yeah. And then the light came. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, and that's indicative of God's foreknowledge of the entire history of earth. He knew what was going to happen. He still left us our choice. He still left it there, but he knew what we were going to do. He still created us. He still created us anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. Knowing at that time what Jesus was going to have to go through. Yeah. Any other comments or questions on, on this part? Don't let me don't let me miss any thoughts. Sometimes I get rambling and I wind up, you know, shutting people down without even intending to do so. Um, I wanted to get down to this whole command thing. The very last couple verses, um, actually starting in verse forty-eight, last three verses. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Think about that for a minute. What is Jesus saying right here? He's saying, I am the word. <laughs> I am the word and John- the command began with with that in yeah. the beginning was the word yeah and so jesus is the the actual fleshing out living out of god's word yes and then he says the command is everlasting life we we stop and think you know of where we're at in this world you you mentioned we were already condemned mhm we were already condemned before Jesus ever came down here. And, and I believe that. I, I'm agreeing with that. His command was not condemnation. It was not to judge the world in the context of you're, you're going to burn in hell. It, it, nothing like that. His command was everlasting life. And if we listen to his word and believe in him and obey that command, we have everlasting life. But the yeah. problem is we don't believe in it. Yeah, that's interesting because the NIV translates it that um, verse 50, his command leads to eternal life. Okay. And in verse 49, 
I didn't speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say. So, so the command was a message for Jesus to say. Mm -hmm. And that message was the Word of God. He lived out the Word of God. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like to... I, I didn't think to, verse, to do yeah, this. Verse 49, it, it, it's saying... That, the same thing. Uh, the Father who has sent me, this is New King James, I believe. Oh, no, this is English Standard Version. The Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, dash, what to say and what to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's saying the same thing as NIV. Now, what was it, New King James But again? The, the question was, not New King James, oh. the question was in verse 50, I know that his command leads to eternal life, but the NIV, uh, the, you're the King James, the New King James, said uh, his command is eternal is life. Is eternal life. Am yeah. I remembering correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm reading in the, the Greek right now, um, just to get clarification since we brought that up. Um, and the Greek, translating it into English, um, is, and I know that the commandment of him, life eternal, is. Yeah. Um, well, but I think the sense. meaning, I think the meaning is the same. Yeah, because yeah. this he also John also said this is eternal life that you know him. So what is it about him that we know or what is it that makes us know him and that is the word. Yes. So and the command is to preach the word and remembering again back in John chapter 1. <laughs> Again, it goes back here because he is also the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And does it not say? Da, 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 da. Oh, I guess it doesn't say that here. Well, it says it in verse four, though, verse three and four, John chapter one, verses three and four. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so. So it's tying all that in together, the yeah. life, the light, eternal life, the commandment of God, it's all wrapped up in together. And really, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong here. This is just theorizing as we talk. But it really sounds to me that John is really putting a hard line between life and darkness, or light and darkness, life and death, uh, following Jesus not following Jesus, obeying or listening, yeah. believing, and not believing. Yeah. It, it's a very hard line, and it brings to point that the same thing that we've been saying all night is the choice. Are we going to harden our hearts like Pharaoh or like these people who did not believe, or are we going to listen to his word and have that life that he wants to give us? The choice is ours. I got Walt and then Dennis. Just keep in the back of your mind, what was the purpose of Jesus coming down here to this earth? Was it not the bottom line that he would show the people when he was here and he would show us as we read about it? What was God like? He's the kind of guy who would heal the sick, mm -hmm. give sight to the blind. All the other things that Jesus did for the people while he was here. That's the kind of guy God is. That's what he wants for us if we'll just let him into our hearts. Well, and that's, that's the key. That's what God wants for us if we'll just let him. And, and I want to emphasize that. I say that a second time to emphasize that because we have to let him do it. He's there. He's ready. He has the ability. He has the power. He has the authority. He will not exercise that authority unless we say yes. Good point. Dennis. Well, what intrigues me is what the command is. Uh, for I do not speak on my own, but the Father has sent me, commanded me to speak all that I have spoken. I know that his command is eternal life. So I would 
query, what is God's command? What's the command? That's what gives you eternal life. And then we find that in 1 John 3, 21. It says, dear friends, if, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. So what's his command? Still wondering what it's because here it is. And this is his command. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. So those are the two things. All right, that's what God's command. That is the command that is eternal life right there. That's the command to trust in the character of Jesus Christ, which is God's shown us God's character and to love one another. And this is the self-sacrificing agape love to love one another as he commands us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Holy Spirit that he gave us. So we know, we know what the God's command is. We know what gives us eternal life, to believe in the character of, the, of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. That's the command of God. Amen. Amen. And I think we can also include, I think you would agree to this, Dennis, that to love one another and to love God is summed up, summing up the you know, you don't lie. You don't, Jesus is the truth. He didn't lie. Be faithful. Mm -hmm. uh, they're breaking down what does it mean to love one another. Yeah. And that's in the simple form. Well, in, Because they, they couldn't understand it without a simple form. That's it. It was like God <laughs> saying, what am I have to do, draw a picture for you? I said, love. Well, what do you mean? He said, let me draw a picture. You know, don't Take the Lord's name in vain on down the list. That, that's what he said, and John said that. He said, uh, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, that one that we have from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. That's it. And this is love. We walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is you walk in love. So the commandments are as we've already been talking about quite a bit, a written description of the character of who God is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Ten Commandments, as they were giving, were expounding on the, the rules or the commandments that God had given before that. You know, it, don't eat of the fruit of the tree. Right. You know, yeah. And then, well, sin entered the world and we, we degraded and, and, and went downhill from there. So let me break it down a little further for you. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Do this. You know. Then when we get to the Sermon on the Mount, let me break it down even further for you. Yeah. you know? <laughs> and really, you know, and it gives, you know, we look back at the people in the, the Bible and we look at them sometimes and we think, wow, man, they really needed God to go to that extent to explain it. And then I look around our world today and <laughs> wow, we really need God to explain this and break Again. it down for us, you know. Break maybe even, even further. further, maybe even further, you know. Um, and sometimes I, I just think, you know, I try to picture what God is sitting there looking like as he looks at our world. And then I change my mind. Okay. Yeah. By the, the, by the way, that was Second John uh, verses 5 and 6 that Jack was reading. I didn't say I don't think so. No, Second John sure. 5 and 6. Sorry, I read it so I knew where it was. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking right there right. to see. But it's just, I, I see Jesus as just wrapping his arms in love around the Ten Commandments. So you can't ever separate the two. Yeah, it, it's interesting because the way the Bible is, is it breaks it down into such a simplistic form, yet it also gathers them up. You'll see uh, John says that God is love. 
You know, so it, it, it scoops it all back up in the arms of God, yeah. and it, it goes both directions. God is love, and love is God, and God's commandments are the the description, the the breakdown, so to speak, of what His character is like, of what love is, and and if we just could grasp that and apply that, what a different place we would be living in. That's what those Pharisees did. They stripped love away from the commandments. They, they, they kept the commandment part without the love. They looked at it as a which, bunch of rules. Which brings the question, if you take the love out of it, are you keeping the commandments? No, no you missed the boat. And I'm torn now because we have nine minutes and we're up against the end of the chapter. Do we want to broach the next chapter? Sure, get a start. Just because do an introduction to it. Yeah, sure, we'll do an introduction. Or, or, or and my, my brief introduction, and then I'll read it. Uh, my brief introduction is everything that we just talked about. You want to see it in action? Here it is. Um, John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And just continuing the, the thought of introduction. Jesus is acting out now love. It is, it is the, the, the physical manifestation because he loved those disciples. And it says to the end. And he got down and washed their feet. He did something for them that the disciples themselves would have been ashamed to do because they were disciples. They had a position. They had a title. And that was not in their job description. And then Jesus, of all, was the one to get up. I should say get down and go do that. He was acting out that light, that love, that, that perfect character of God. And it was far deeper than just the simple act of washing the feet. One of the messages of this act is, in your service for the Lord, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Mm. Jesus wasn't. Jesus wasn't afraid to touch the lepers. He would touch feet that had been walking through, what can I say on live TV? Um, horse pucky. Um <laughs> Refuse, thank you. Uh, you know, the dirtiest, most vile part of a human at that time and age, he was willing to touch. 
because it drew them closer into relationship with him. It was intimate. It was an intimate act. And it was something that, as he pointed out, was necessary. And so Jesus was not afraid to do that. And, and I want to just stop and think, you know, <clears throat> applying this, you know, we, we just did the, the communion service and we had the foot washing. It's something that we practice regularly. And, and just the act itself is an experience. But if we were to take that experience, the, the example that he gave, and apply it to every aspect of our life, not just getting down once every so often, regularly, I almost said religiously, regularly, and, and washing feet, and then getting up and going back to the way we were. I think his point was, I've given you an example by washing your feet, but apply it to everything in your life. It's not just the washing of the feet, but it's what's in the heart when you wash the feet. Walter. If there's someone in the church whom I'm having trouble with, who I disagree with, who maybe has hurt me, that's a perfect person for me to kneel down and wash their feet. It's a good opportunity for reconciliation. And when you're done washing each other's feet, you stand up, you pray, and you hug. And I'm going to go... You can't keep disliking them. I'm going to go on the opposite side of that, too, and I know you implied it. Um, if I've done something against someone else, then that's a good person for me to go. Um, it goes both ways. You know, when you, when you read through Matthew, you, you have... Uh, Matthew 18, when, when someone has offended you, and then you have Matthew, and I'm forgetting the exact chapter. I wanted to say five. Um, it's an opportunity to forgive. Yeah, Math, Matthew 5, uh, 21 through 26 is saying, if you've done something against someone else. So the, the street goes both ways. If there's a problem, there needs to be a reconciliation. You need to draw together. It's not always easy to do, just like it's not easy to get down there and wash some people's feet. You know, it's not easy to let someone else wash my feet. But it is something that is important, and, and it is tied in so closely with reconciliation. It's not easy, but it is important to do it. Kind of going in a different direction. Why do you think Peter was reluctant? Why, why was he saying, oh, no, you, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet? Well, my first answer is because of where his feet had been. Um, but Peter, Peter has this history with Jesus. I am not worthy. Remember in the fishing boat with the miracle. Lord, get away from me. I am not worthy to be, even be in your presence. Um, he, he's very... What's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it right now. I wasn't anticipating that question. but Very <laughs> boisterous. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. Very boisterous, very spur of the moment, high emotion, and act on that immediately. And so when, he's, when he gets this emotion, when he's overwhelmed with something, he speaks really before thinking it out. And, and we see Jesus helping him think it out through this process. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think really it has to do with, I'm not, worthy to, I'm not worthy for you to be the one washing my feet. I agree. And that's what I've always thought. But I was just now sitting here and looking at the last, or next to the last verse, verse 16, that you read. Uh, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Um, I'm wondering, uh, probably not consciously, but unconsciously, all of those disciples had to be thinking, whoa. If Jesus is going to do this to me, I need to be willing to do it with other people who I think of as lower than me. Mm -hmm. It was tearing away at their desire to be number one and yeah. helping them to see that they needed to be willing to serve. Yeah. And on that note, um, I, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the thought I want to leave with us tonight, and we'll come back to this next week. 
But that's your homework. <laughs> that's your homework. Find that person, whether it's someone you know or someone you don't know, but somebody that, that you are not inclined to feel like you want to serve and find a way to serve them in your own unique way, however the Lord leads you. That's your homework this week, okay? Uh, let's, let's close on that note. Father, we thank you for the example of Jesus, for your loving kindness, for teaching us and breaking it down for us. Sometimes we need it broke down further. But Lord, we pray that this week you'll inspire us to find that one person, maybe two, and, and find a way that we can be a humble servant leader to them. Sure. Just to point them to Jesus Christ and your love. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh.